Hi, everybody. Welcome to our webinar. Uh, thank you for, for being patient with us for a moment while we just got sorted. Uh, let me make this actually. I'm going to share my screen. So instead of looking at, at us, you're looking at the screen. Great. Great. Well, uh, awesome. Oh, this isn't my screen. Awesome. Uh, well, welcome everyone to uh, our webinar on transforming transit, uh, funding transit at the same level as highways. My name is Jenna Fortunati. I'm the Policy and Communications Associate at Transportation for America, which is a program of Smart Growth America. Uh, and as you, uh, some of you might be aware, this is our third webinar in our uh, Beyond EVs a Week of Action. Our whole mission uh, during this Earth Week is to make sure that folks know that electric vehicles are an important part part of uh, uh, reducing our transportation emissions, but not the only part. Uh, so we're really excited to discuss investing in transit with you today. Uh, if you want some more information on why electric vehicles aren't enough on their own to reduce transportation emissions, my co uh, colleague Ray Labellas hosted a great webinar yesterday on our report last year, Driving Down Emissions, that will be available to view on YouTube later this week. Uh, great. So before we get started with our panel discussion, I just want to, you know, a couple of housekeeping things. I'm going to start the presentation with a brief overview of the federal transportation program, and then we're going to go right into our panel. Please feel free to put questions into the, uh, whoopsies, into the question uh, thing at your screen throughout the presentation. Instead of doing Q&A at the end, we're going to mix in some audience questions throughout the panel uh, conversation. So let's get right into it. Great, great. So a brief overview of the federal transportation program. So in short, all of our federal funding for transportation is decided by a authorization bill that's passed every five to six years. This bill determines how much the federal government can spend on transportation every year and what we spend it on. Uh, and we have a huge opportunity this year because the current law, the FAST Act, is expiring this September. It was actually set to expire last September, but Congress passed a, a bill just to keep it going for one extra year to give themselves some, some more time, um, which is good for us because we have more time to make it better. Great. Uh, and before we get you know, more into our, our conversation on the EV20 split, I just want to uh, show briefly where transportation emissions come from. Uh, as you can see, transportation is actually the largest source of emissions uh, in the United States. For a long time, it was the energy in industry, but in the last couple of years, transportation has overshot uh, um, energy as the source of emissions, largely because we are inducing more driving through our federal transportation program. Uh, most of our transportation emissions come from cars, uh, cars and trucks. Uh, and this is largely because when we spend so much money on building new roads, we induce more driving through something called induced, uh, induced demand, which I won't go into much here because we uh, was the focus of our webinar yesterday. But again, this will be available to view next week if you're interested. I also want to talk about just you know setting some more information about you know the transportation system, how our current you know transportation system in the United States is is very unequal. Uh, in much you know many parts of the country, many people's you know only and best, most convenient and safest transportation option is to drive. But driving is not available to everyone. You have to be able to afford you know on average ten thousand dollars a year. Uh, to operate a vehicle and you have to be physically able to drive a vehicle as well. Um, and this is uh, you know, vastly unequal. Uh, here it's broken uh, down by race and you can see that uh, not everyone has equal access to a vehicle in this country, uh, particularly black Americans with 19% uh, of black households don't have access to a vehicle. This is a huge problem as in a country where so much of our built environment is only accessible by car. Um, Great. And then focusing on transit ridership, uh, people of color make up 60% of transit riders, according to the American Public Transportation Association. And Black Americans are the single largest group within people of color as well. So this doesn't match our uh, demographics as a country. Uh, you can see that transit is um, overwhelmingly people of color uh, ride transit in higher rates than, than other groups. Great. So let's go right into our panel. I'm going to stop uh, showing my screen. And now I, can everyone see our, our fantastic panelists? Awesome. Let me, now I'm just going to introduce everybody and then we could get started. Great. 
So first, I want to introduce Dr. Beverly Scott. Uh, she has served as the general manager for four major transit agenc agencies, including the MBTA in Boston, MARTA in Atlanta, and the Sacramento Regional Transit Authority, and the Rhode Island Public Transit Authority, uh, which is one of only four statewide public transit systems. Uh, three years ago, she founded a nonprofit for youth called Introducing Youth to American Infrastructure uh, that has a focus on young people of color and young women, both significantly under represented in transportation and other lifeline infrastructure sectors. Uh, Beverly, thanks so, so much for joining us. I also want to introduce Danny, yay. <laughs> uh, Danny Perlstein, who is the uh, Policy and Communications Director of Riders Alliance, an advocacy organization that fights for reliable, uh, reliable, affordable, wor world-class public transit in a more just and sustainable New York. Uh, he previously worked at the New York City Council uh, as well. I also want to introduce Bakari Haidt, who's the co-founder of MARTA Army, which is an independent grassroots action group committed to enhancing the ridership experience on public transit in Metro Atlanta. He's also worked as an urban planner for the city of Atlanta, the Dallas area rapid transit system, and the Georgia Department of Transportation. Great, so I'm um, so excited to, to have you guys here. It's gonna be a great conversation. Um, so let's start with uh, Danny. Can you tell us a little bit about what this thing called the 80-20 split is and, and why does it exist? Sure. Thank you, Jenna, and thanks so much for having me and, and great to be here with, uh, with you, Bakari, and with you, Dr. Scott. Um, you know, the 80-20 split is now several decades old and it's a deal, you know, essentially, a, you know, the old, School gentlemen's agreement among senior congressional leaders to fund highways four times as much as transit is funded in the federal budget. And it dates back to 1982, um, which was marked the end of an era, right? It was early in the, the Reagan years. It was the Reagan backlash to the civil rights movement and the successes of the Great Society. And in 1981 was the high point when transit and highways were funded equally as the federal government finished up its work on the transit systems in Atlanta, Miami, Washington, and the Bay Area. And the 80-20 split has saddled us ever since with a dramatically underfunded public transit system all around the country. And the American Society for Civil Engineers now estimates we're pushing $200 billion in you know, unfunded repair needs across the country. And uh, you know, the justification for it has been you know, historically that gas taxes were paid by, you know, drivers of cars and trucks and roads pay for themselves, where, you know, in, in actual fact, since 2008, Congress has bailed out the Highway Trust Fund with over $150 billion from the general fund. So, in fact, cars and trucks are, are not paying their own way. And, uh, you know, every investment needs to be evaluated on its own terms. And, of course, we argue that the 80-20 split, you know, contributes to, to all of the, the problems we see in the country in terms of, you know, inequities from, from race to climate and the environment, and it's high time to end the split and to equalize highway and transit funding. Mm -hmm. Danny, I'm glad you brought up how the logic for even maintaining the 80-20 split has not only does it not make sense because you know the gas tax doesn't uh, cover the full expenditures of the highway trust fund, which is the main, you know, in theory the main bucket of money for uh, federal transportation spending, but also you know the in the last couple of years the federal government has not adhered to the 80-20 split in additional you know spending bills, especially with the last two, last three uh, COVID-19 recovery packages that not only didn't adhere to the 80-20 split by giving you know thankfully so much relief to transit agencies, but also broke with the, you know, the unofficial federal policy of not funding uh, transit operations and only funding transit maintenance and, and capital needs. So, so it definitely, um, I'm, yeah, I'm really glad, glad you hit on that because it doesn't really make any, any sense. Uh, uh, Beverly, you know, I was wondering if you turn to you next and just talk about you know, how did this, you know, severe, you know, imbalance of funding affect your ability to deliver, you know, high quality transit service as a general manager for so many different transit agencies? Well, you know, Jenna, any time that you wind up setting up a situation where you have an upstairs and a downstairs on a big table and the little kid's table, that right away, uh, it doesn't matter whether you're talking about trans or anything else, people become very clear in terms of what the priorities are, what are the re where, where are the resources going to go. And so um, that it's, it's it, and so that's just real, okay, and it's just common sense. I, 
what I would say to you, so no question, the fact that we started out with this, you, you know, you got the big kids got 80% and we got 20%, absolutely, uh, you know, all the things that you can just imagine what you would have been able to do and what you could have done if in fact we had had those those kinds of funds uh, uh, would have been able to have uh, come to us in a, in a equitable way, okay? Now, I, 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 I'm very much into the, and I think this is one of the most critical building blocks, which is let's get the money right, okay? However it flows, it should wind up flowing uh, uh, equitably. But this to me is really tied to a much bigger thing, okay? So we got one major building block, and that is the whole thing in terms of let's have a level playing field in terms of where the dollars are. But I think that this is very much tied to a vision thing and a lack thereof, okay? We can decry it, but at least at the time that it started, it was with a vision of it did what it was. They thought, OK, we were going to build the interstate highway system with this was a, a post World War II industrial system. We have cars all over the place. And the vision that we have of where we want to be is leave it to Beaver and, uh, uh, see people, and Ozzie and Harriet and Ozzie and Harriet. OK, young people won't even connect what I'm talking about that. But that was the American dream. OK, now we know that was a a completely non-sustainable dream, off dream, inequitable dream, but that is literally kind of what was driving all of this. And I would submit to you that we have pieces of this together, but what we have failed to do in this country is to really wind up in its North Star guiding light making time, is to really line ourselves up and say from a vision standpoint, that is not what we want. This is what we want. The dollars will flow freely and they will be outcome driven. OK, and when we can get clear about what those outcomes are and then tie that with performance measures, the dollars having a level playing field, then we're really cooking uh, completely on all cylinders. Mm -hmm. I know I, I'm really glad you brought that up to how, you know, since we adhere so blindly to the 80-20 split, the federal program has so entirely lost sight of what the outcomes of the spending should be. Uh, uh, and I, yeah, I, you know, I definitely agree that, you know, what we want to achieve with this money should definitely set where it's going. Uh, yeah, Bakari, I want to turn to you because Atlanta is a really interesting city to me because I've never been, but what I've heard is that it's a it's land use is you know it's very sprawling. It's hard to get around when you're not in a car, uh, and you know often this you know in kind of environment has you know replicated itself all across the country, and a lot of it has to do with the fact that we just provide state DOT so much more uh, funding for highways and for any other kind of uh, transportation investment. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you know the severe funding for highways has undermined uh, any investment you could make in transit you know especially in the atlanta region and what and how that affects riders in atlanta uh yes definitely jenna um metro atlanta is definitely another landscape like other sunbelt cities that were that came up after the the invention of the vehicle to where our landscape is directly tied towards vehicle use which is bad because a lot of our land uses now are given into gentrification to the Manhattanization of a lot of these urban centers that would be transit rich to where there's not a mix of housing. So it pushes those who actually need transit out to the suburbs to where now we have the opposite to where we have the transit need in the suburban landscape. And I think that's gonna be really indicative of projects uh, that we're pursuing here in Metro Atlanta, like the Clayton County bus rapid transit lines and the lines out there. Uh, and even if we can get the the lines to North Fulton and South Fulton um, ready is to to really flip the script on how we're we're perceiving this and how we're moving forward with this, and especially with um, the Georgia Department of Transportation and them being so road heavy. Um, I think it's easy to and at this point with the the change in politics is to to turn the tide of this conversation around to show that transit is essential and we need to not look at it as an evil that we should. Um, that we shouldn't put any money towards, but usually as a as a necessary need, and especially with um, Amtrak's plans of putting intercity rail through through the state of Georgia, that would cut right through it, and that's something we haven't seen since before the 70s. And I like to put history to a lot of things because that's what America's landscape looked like in the in the early um, 1900s was streetcars and interurbans everywhere, and we can bring that back, but we have to prioritize and we have to see it as a need and not necessarily as a liability. 
uh, you know, before we, we get into, you know, what we could achieve uh, if we rethought the 80-20 split, if we, uh, you know, dared to fund, you know, transit and highways uh, equally, uh, I really want to dig into what the, you know, consequences of not thinking about how we spend money on transportation and just spending 80% on highways uh, are, you know, especially in terms of, of equity and just how inequitable our transportation system is, how it's so impossible to participate in the economy if you don't have access to a, a car. Uh, so yeah, I just want to throw that out to the you know whole panel. Uh, you know what uh, what it really means for you know people on, on, you know just li living in cities where you can't access things without a, without a car. Um, you know, especially from Danny and, and Bakari, who are just so you know on the ground with riders every single day and you know navigating an environment where uh, uh, transit just uh, struggles to thrive. Yeah, I can definitely go first. Um, I lived in <laughs> <laughs> because I've lived it. I've lived eight years in Atlanta without a vehicle, and then I lived a year and a half in Dallas without a vehicle. Both very similar environments as far as equity is concerned. And I lived downtown in all, in all these places. So it was even more difficult to, to realize how how much behind the, the society is as far as it, because I usually had 30 minutes to an hour wait for buses at a time, and I would only be going two miles. It's just getting groceries is a hassle, getting social services, which are now being ported to the suburbs is a hassle, and just having to, to constantly think about your trips. Whereas when you look at cities like uh, cities in Western Europe, or even parts of New York and San Francisco, it, it's not even an afterthought. You have frequent service everywhere. So it, it really hurts us as far as people who either don't have uh, the means to get around quickly or those who can't afford it to really make our voices heard. And that's why groups like Marta Army exist. That's why groups like Writers Alliance exist, because we want to be able to uplift folks who are having the same issues and finding solutions for that. Um, but it's definitely listening to testaments of people who are living this and not just assuming that because these ridership numbers are out, you know, we're, do we're doing a positive thing within this this agency. I mean, numbers don't always tell the story. Sometimes you have mm -hmm. to go to the constituents because they're the ones that are living, especially the folks that were operating the vehicles. Uh, a lot of the transit unions definitely have stories and definitely can tell a, and, and paint a larger picture of what's actually going on. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly right. You know, when we think about what we need for an equitable recovery, it's reliable, it's accessible, frequent and affordable public transit service. And in order for that to happen, we need a reliable federal partner. And so, you know, we need double or triple the amount of funding we've had for state of good repair and public transit. You know, and even that's not going to get, get us to the level that the, the ASCE says we need to be. And at the same time, we need to make sure that transit is frequent and affordable enough for people to use. So we mm -hmm. need a federal operating subsidy for urban transit systems, something that's comparable to what we've received for the past year what rural systems have been able to rely on, and frankly, what our global peer cities demand and receive from their national governments. You know, we are mm -hmm. so grievously underinvesting in infrastructure, and where it hurts the most is the way it perpetuates racial inequality, and it you know complicates our efforts to combat climate change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, re I'm really glad. I'm sorry. Uh, I mean, yeah, I'm really glad you brought up operating support because I think that the the absolute you know federal lack of any federal oper operating support kind of underscores that you know nationally there's a misperception of what makes people ride transit, why people ride transit, what ingredients you need for transit to succeed in terms of frequency and you know reliability. Uh, Beverly, I'd love if you could you know touch upon you know just given your vast experience leading transit agencies, what you've learned to be what what's needed needed for to create a transit system that people can count on without you know having to plan their trips out you know days in advance yeah well i you know i want to say the uh uh make a couple observations about the uh as we're having this conversation which it is just like a it's just like a no-brainer that we need to wind up being able to have the level playing field but the reality is that and it's been brought up we are not and I don't want us to get stuck there and focus on what I call the hole and not the donut, okay? The reality is that there needs to be significantly increased transportation investment mm -hmm. that winds up taking place in this country. If we took all of what we have and it was a level playing field, 
as Danny just said and Bakara was saying, when you look at what others are investing in both the physical assets as well as in the people side of what is taking place in other countries, it's, it's abysmal in terms of where the United States falls out on and you get, you kind of get what you, what you put in. Okay. And so the investment, the amount of funding that we're putting in needs to be significantly increased. Now I'll say this to you. Okay. I am, and I haven't had a car since 2012. Okay. You know what I'm saying? And so, you know, so I, I, I try to kind of walk what I talk. Okay. So that's what I'm going to come to a walk. Okay. It, transportation is very important and transit is very important, but you have to have, we have to have whole systems. There was a time in my life that I sat at the table like pork, and I was trying to be porky pig too. I said, I gotta have this, this gotta have. It. And then, and, and as I got older and wiser, I realized that what I had to have was I had to have complete system. I had to have complete systems, okay? And so I said, the first thing people are is pedestrians first. And so I need to have, and I, I need to have a sidewalks. I need to be able to have it be so this whole thing in terms of land use and how we knit everything together. I don't need to have people going to stand in mud and a hole to try to catch it. Mm -hmm. I could be, I needed the frequency, I need the reliability, I need all that, but I need it to be all working together. Okay. And so I kind of have gotten, I don't get myself into these big competitive, I, I say what I mean in terms of the level playing field and all that, but this is not to me in any way a competition. I need to have that freight moving. I'm looking at all this Amazon and all that. So, I mean, we got a whole bunch of things that need to be all synced up and making bigger investment. And there is no question in terms of transit absolutely being critical, but at the same time, we need to make sure that all the other pieces of the infrastructure, the lighting, the all of that come together to wind up being able to make it where we literally are putting everything on a level playing field. And that is land use, that is zoning, that is having a, a whole different, as Bakara was talking about, a whole different view of what does it take in terms of things being livable, okay? Mm -hmm. And that 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 would be the, uh, the perspective I would share. Oh, that is that is so spot on. If it, it, you know, it's, yeah, it's a, it's awful to see so many bus stops just on the side of the road with not even route information, and of course not a bench, no sidewalk to get there. That's what I'm talking about. And you talk, we talking about Atlanta, and then you go down in places like you go down in the Delta, you get in Mississippi, you go down in that. And I'm talking about. It. I mean, you know, you go look at where it could be out in Nevada. I look at what some of these. Uh, where where what people are doing where they have nothing really but what we would call rural and all of those kinds of systems and how in the world are people beginning to even think about knitting their lives together just know the lack of coordination and once again what's the picture of how does it all how does it all come together and then as Bakari mm -hmm. was saying the flip that wound up taking place in terms of spatial dis I mean now we're talking about uh you know for all practical purposes uh, uh, what we used to have, poor people and all that being in the inner cities, they have been displaced in droves. And so now they're out in these suburban areas and exurban areas where before we would have said, oh no. So now we got to deal with that whole portion because none of that was really, that really was built up around Ozzy and Harriet. Okay, and I'm saying, so it's a whole lot of um, bigger, all of us needing to be at the table and at the tent and making sure that those dollars, and that's why I come back to the performance, more money, level playing field, accountability, and drive it by performance and outcomes. And those are the mm -hmm. things I think that we, and equity being centered, not an afterthought. And and mm -hmm. um, and I think that's how we do it. Ah, definitely. I don't know if Danny Bacar, if you guys want to add anything, add anything onto that before I move on to a, a question from the audience. Um, uh, great. Well, yeah, just you kind of going off that, you know, got this, uh, you know, an audience question uh, on uh, what can we do to rethink transit as a public good similar to education rather than a social service for a limited transportation challenged population, uh, which I think is you know really interesting because you're you're totally right. I think a lot of you know lawmakers have this perception that that transit is just for just for low income people. And if why would you ride transit if you could afford a car? Which is uh, which is first of all we should be providing great transit service for everybody. Um, and it, I think it's just a, a misconception of, uh, you know, that people don't want to, if you have, if you are able to, maybe people don't want to spend that much money on a car every year. Um, 
so I'd love for you guys to you know to discuss that question, uh, rethinking you know public transit as a as a public good um, rather than a social service. Yeah. So what I say in New York is so. that we're so we're halfway there, right? We know in New York it's not just a social service, right? We have close to 60% of the population commuting by public transit, but we don't treat it as a public good. You know, we also have, you know, a very high fare box recovery in New York, which is why our system, you know, was was utterly destroyed financially by the pandemic because when ridership evaporated, you know, we instantly lost several billion dollars. Um, and I think the, the way we build back is with a federal partnership that recognizes the intrinsic value of transit for economic growth, for racial equity, for climate justice, and that makes those critical investments to reduce reliance on the fare box in places like New York and to enable right. other systems to develop the frequency necessary to build up ridership. Right, right, right. You know, and I, um, I think in that, and I'm gonna try to let Bakara get to it, is that um, I, I would just say this, because I'm, I'm the grandmother up here about 20 some years ago, maybe about 25 years ago, we had a whole bunch of folks that were going all over from the United States, were going all over Europe and that, and it was primarily Europe then, trying to figure out what was the magic formula of what they had that we didn't. And I tell you the honest to God's truth, I'm hammering on it again, is coming back vision. What were they trying to accomplish? And this is where I ended up. They were real intentional about wanting to have transit systems that were systems of first choice, not last resort. Most of, and so then they synergistically, it wasn't by chance that they had parking fees that were this, petroleum prices that were up this, da da da, da because they knew what they were driving to, okay? So for us in the United States, Jenna, you have hit it. It's all the conversation we have. We basically have built public transit as a system of last resort, except in boots, you know, where people got it, okay? From a, a systems of last resort, we have funded them as last resort, and people typically are always talking about building transit for someone else to use. And I will submit to you that until we get it up in here, and not just philosophically get it up in here or academically get it up in here. But until we, the big we, actually flip the script for ourselves and stop working off of a 20th century playbook and say we are going to build systems of first resort, a system that I will use, my family will use, my neighbor will use, my friends and colleagues don't use it every day, then I will submit to you that we will continue to keep ourselves in kind of this rut of, we kind of want to get there, we understand all the climate data, we know we're the biggest submitter, but we, as a we, have not yet embraced the fact that we got to walk the talk. If we want to accomplish all these carbon and this and that, I tell people, unless you feel, unless we flip transportation, it ain't happening. Okay, and I would submit to you that that is that that, that is part of this will and this real connecting of all of those dots is what we have to do in order to be able to get there. Mm -hmm. De definitely, yeah, I, I, the whole picture really changes changes it. Um, I, I, that makes me think, you know, one of the, the, the biggest strengths of funding transit and highways equally, you know, from my perspective, is that it gives states and cities and towns the choice to invest in transit. Often, um, you know, within the federal transportation program, uh, the federal government will uh, tend to match the, the cost of a highway project covering up to 80% uh, to 90% of a highway project. But on a transit uh, capital or maintenance project, uh, uh, the federal government will only often only cover up to 40% of the cost of a transit project. So equal funding could, you know, hopefully, you know, change that ratio and just make it a lot easier for, for cities and, and towns to choose transit. Uh, one of the you know, questions we just got from the, the audience is that, uh, you know, Alabama's uh, transit receives no funding from the state other than what it receives from the federal government, which makes it really hard for Birmingham to, to fund its transit system, uh, and which leads to a lot of uh, bus routes being being uh, you know absolutely you know cut uh, deleted. Um, uh, so was, the question uh, for you guys is uh, how could we convince the Biden administration uh, to get to 50-50 funding, knowing that you know the 80 percent really uh, yeah, incentivizes states and cities to double down on highways and sprawl. Well, I can go first, speaking on another state that 
literally just in 2021 secured state funding for capital projects for transit. Uh, you have to be able to, to stay competitive with it. And um, Atlanta's definitely, we just won uh, nailing Microsoft and Google that wants to make Atlanta an East Coast hub. That's amazing. Right. And one of their um, initiatives was to put $6 million in a, in a stub station that was built in Bankhead, which is a largely black neighborhood. Um, and that's the power of transit fare, of just showing how much you can enhance transit because it's not only going to put a lot into that station, but it's going to put a lot in the trunk line that has been ignored ever since Marta first started building rail. That was the original right. line, was the blue line. So now there's going to be an, an even larger trunk because of the um, uh, of the aspect of, of expanding the green line out. Um, and that's another point of places like Alabama. Alabama's also um, ships um, headquarters is in Birmingham. Um, and they just um, did a ribbon cutting for the bus rapid transit line. So Birmingham could be another slew of cities like Richmond, Virginia, like Indianapolis, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. use bus rapid transit as a standard for saying that you don't need rail to push transit. You don't need right. this huge elaborate system to push transit. You just need to figure out where people are going, where people are living and connected to. That's why we have to have these connections with these jurisdictions to, to ingrain it in, in their zoning. We need these um, housing organizations to ingrain transit into their fold. We need, like Dr. Scott said, we need these connections to go on because it's psychological. It's If you can't show people how they can use transit in their daily lives, they're not gonna fund it. And especially not at the state level. I mean, you have to see how it's uh, any more of an amenity as being by a river is or being by the mountains are you have to show that it's actually going to drive your economy and so really i don't you think we really i think I, as i've thought back on it i said we really to some respects have done ourselves a disservice through the years because i'm not going to run away from ridership and all of that's important i used to crassly say my business once again i'm the grandmother i used to crassly say my business was butts and seats okay and there's i mean and there is an element of that but what we have failed to do i think it, enough of and this comes back to metrics and stuff is how do we define ourselves we let ourselves get defined by fair box recovery we let ourselves get defined by you know butts and seats and really this multiplier effect of what we're talking about, which is the result of transit investment in terms of economics, in terms of social justice, in terms of all of those, the, 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 that's who we are and that's what we do. And that, you know, somebody said to me this year for the first time, and I almost could have cried. I was, was in a people conversation. I said, what do you tell young people about why they should want to be in these careers? And, why? and the man looked at me, he was from Crystal, Minnesota. And he said, Dr. Scott, do you know what I tell these young people when I go in? We make normal happen. I could have just, and I, I mean, it was more significant because of the pandemic, okay? But that, and that is what we do, okay? All of, you know, I don't want to get into 36% of all the people who are essential employees of riding transit, all desperate, but that's what we do every day. And that's what we're funding when we, in fact, wind up funding public transportation and these essential services like public trans, your public transportation is a part of the piece of paratransit, so all of that. We help make normal happen, okay? And for the most vulnerable populations that we have, seniors in this disability community and all, all of that, really, really make normal happen and so you know i mean and it don't get much better than that and mm -hmm. trying to find the indicators that are not just the fair box or whatever um that, that i think is part of what we have to do our we have to help ourselves with as well yeah oh i love the making normal happen uh that's such a great way of thinking about it i uh, it makes me it kind of goes back to how just you know inequitable our transportation system is and especially for you know people with disabilities uh so i would love if you know you guys could talk about how a national investment in transit like equal funding between transit and highways could you know help increase uh how accessible our you new know, transportation network is as, as a whole or what or what an national investment in transit could do for accessibility um
Well, it's an area I'm so emotional about because of uh, uh, I, well, I lost my own mother this past year and, uh, and that kind of stuff. But this is the point. The difference of being able to have mobility and access. The ability to be able to go to that senior center where they're doing the boot scooting boogie and you're 85 years old. The difference of being able to give you a reason for wanting to still feel vital and a part of and have independence and respect. That's what it makes the that's what either having these services and accessibility and of, of, of services that are needed or not is it's really about it's really about people's lives. So I can't I couldn't even begin to put a number on it, a, a dollar number on it, but the 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 magic and the difference that it makes in terms of just those things, the essentials that people have, but their independence, their quality of life, the whole nine yards. Um you just can't say enough. And when you look at the demographics of this country and the aging of this country and all of that, I don't know about other people, but uh, just like child care on the one end, the group that I'm with, all the considerations in terms of elder care and how that all takes place for households around this country, regardless of race or anything, is major. And so this whole issue of mobility and access and making sure that people can still feel vital is very is is absolutely critical for us all mm -hmm. of us mm -hmm. and that i uh, yeah that is that is so spot on i uh, one of the i uh, it which brings me to one of the audience members asked like how do we paint this vision your vision for transit our vision for transit as as not just you know buses and trains but as something that makes a critical difference in people's lives and and can be something that you don't have to think about is just how you get around uh, how can we paint that that vision for people especially when so many lawmakers you know still adhere to you know uh ridership numbers and uh, uh if transit can pay for itself as a measure of success how do we shift the the uh you know how we see transit I'm smiling because my young people told me my interns, they working on Instagrams and stuff. Oh Lord, they're gonna keep me young. They told me they said, Doc, we what we want a just normal. That's what they told me. They going on revolution. They want a just normal. They said, what kind of normal you want? We don't want to go back to the normal we had that's got all the, the digital divides and transit doesn't get the money it should have. And, this and that and the other we want a just normal and they want young people at the table helping to reimagine this vision thing we talk about we need to do some reimagining and some visioning and really i do say very much definitely wind up having uh having youth as part because we really got to flip the script really really flip it and make that become the guiding light I think we got a lot of pieces of it there, but I just don't think it's been really as much knitted together with a real, this is who we are, this is where we're going, that's what we want. And quite sad, candidly, since these big 20, 30, 20, 40, 20, 50s are really, I hope I'm around, but I'm a lot of that, I'm gonna be dead for, okay? So why should I be the one that's, that's taking up, sucking up all the room at the decision-making tables when quite candidly, that future is the future that's going to be for the youth. So I would just simply say that, um, I, I, they got it, and I think that we could be doing a whole lot of reimagining to go along with what the, the transit parity. I like this piece that they had, or uh, the, uh, the the Congress did about the invest plan, which was really on the whole thing about performance metrics and all that. I think we're getting all the pieces, and I think we get ourselves a real big national thing. It might sound hooky, but I mean reimagine, 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 so we can replace this old highway centric all that craziness and say now this is really the picture of what we want all our mobility systems of transportation this is what we really want to see become who we are for the next uh you know next 25 50 100 years and knit all the climate and land use and all of that together into a holistic picture mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, Danny and Bakari, since we're we're getting you know so many questions about advocacy, uh, you know, I was wondering, you know, in your experience, you know, as local advocates, what kind of messages have really resonated with local lawmakers, state lawmakers, kind of explaining this vision for transit, and and you know, when when a, a audience member asked particularly, like, how do you explain to a lawmaker who doesn't ride transit that a thirty or twenty minute wait for the bus is just un 
usable, um, untenable. Well, I can I can start there. You know, in New York, we have a special situation where most New Yorkers have personal experience with transit, but for so many lawmakers in particular, they feel like they've graduated from transit, where now they get to be a driver and they have the, the wealth and status and comfort to drive. They don't have to arrive at work on time. They're their own boss, and they usually don't commute, you know, to the most congested parts of the city where, where transit makes the biggest difference. Um, but what they often don't realize is how many of their constituents depend on it and who among their constituents depend on it. And further, you know, when push comes to shove, I think they have to admit that their constituents' time is valuable and that even the time of a person who depends on transit is valuable. And that, you know, it may not be that they're, they're taking the bus to work at an investment bank, but they're taking it to their job as a home health aide. And the time with their client is valuable. And the time coming home is incredibly valuable with their children. The investment they make in their children, whether they can cook a meal themselves or whether they have to buy fast food. And really drilling down into people's lives and saying, your commute is visible. You know, it's not just this invisible thing that happens in between the important parts of your day, but your commute is a big part of your life. And I think that the, the pandemic has laid bare how that was true for many people and how it's still true for so many people. And it really, it has helped us make the invisible visible in, in a new way that I think people are appreciating more and more. But I think it, it helps to remind people that time matters, that everyone's time matters. Right. And I'll add on to that. Um, it's all about coalition building when you're speaking to um, lawmakers. Um, uh, I led a coalition here in Atlanta um, and we spoke to one of Senator Warnock's staffers uh, two weeks ago and we gave a comprehensive list of things that we wanted within the state of Georgia as far as transit. Um, and it helped us to tell stories about what's happening and especially as it relates to uh, a senator who's from a city that doesn't have as, as good a transit um, named Savannah, Georgia, that now has this opportunity to be connected to an intercity rail system in two mm -hmm. places. Um, and also he leads a, a church next to a streetcar and in and, and a, and a mostly black neighborhood. So, and it's kind of finding those connections to that stories where you can resonate and where you can see these parishioners that take MARTA to get to their services, to where you do see a lot of these people taking uh, these services to get to senior centers, as well as a lot of your constituents who have never seen Atlanta because they haven't had any feasible way to get up there. Flights are too expensive. And there's always racist police on the road. Why would you drive? Right. So it's just kind of making these connections uh, in in people's daily lives and looking at it not as we're doing this so we can get this money. No, we're doing this because we want to make a difference, and this is the perfect time to. We've been stuck in this in this state for literally a year and a half of having to quarantine, and and it gives us time to to really assess: do we want to remain this way when we get to a place of normalcy, or are we going to be and foster this change that we want? And that also goes into these agencies going into these communities. I know that was one thing Marta did well was they actually sent representatives to these neighborhood planning units, these civic organizations. I hope that continues because that's the one way that you're gonna absolutely see changes that you go to these people who have these visions of what their community want to look like. Right, right. Oh my gosh. And you know, the other thing I've always found interesting too is everything that's being said, and then let's take it another step. Take a ride with me. So have every member of Congress, and, and I can, the whole thing in terms of advocacy building with really having the stories, it makes a difference when somebody's hearing from Mr. or Miss Susie or Danny, like you were saying, who's actually in Bagar, in my, this is, you're in my district and this is what you live in. But then let's take them another step and let's have a pen. When we reimagine, take a ride with me. And if we can have that ride be with one of their constituents, so they're standing out there without the sidewalk, they're seeing what it actually winds up meaning to wind up having a hour before you can wind up doing whatever. That is what you call, I can show you better than I can tell you. Okay, and that's and we're asking for. And I tell you the honest to God's truth, realness and authenticity and have them have a pen. Have you taken your ride today? Okay, I tell you, it'll make a difference. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Dr. Scott, this may, I actually think this is a great question for all of you, but Dr. Scott, you might have some more like 
uh, in the weeds mm -hmm. experience of, of it. But uh, I guess got this question from the audience about how there's a lot of regulatory hurdles to building transit where they might not be with highways. Uh, based, the person writes, basically for highways, if you have funds and did an environmental review, you can just go ahead and build it, you know, an eminent domain, whatever you'd like and demolish whatever you'd like. I mean, oftentimes, you know, communities of color. Uh, but what could be done to create regulatory parity between highways and transit? You know, I just always say the same thing. Uh, it, 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 the democratic process works as a democratic process. If we want there to be parity, and which we do, who is it that causes the people to be in the places they are that write the things? It's us, okay, you know what I'm saying? And so what the what the what we need to do is once again, based on advocacy and making sure that people are very clear about what are the actual things that we're going for and what do we want is to have that become a part of what communities we we let these things become too much of an insider game where we're having a conversation amongst ourselves about what is the problem everything can get a solution okay particularly when it's an inequitable thing but you have to be able to bring visibility to it and it can't just be insiders let's wind up having these advocacy groups have the list here's the big list of 10 that transit agencies can't do because of x now part of the challenge is that with people this is why coordination is so incredible critic, critical land use decisions and things of that nature i've been a little bit retired for a while but i the last time i looked there were only about four or five transit agencies in the entire country that had real land use authority okay mm -hmm. and so uh georgia Re georgia regional is actually one of them uh, it wasn't martin mm -hmm. but greta did okay and so these are the kinds of things of really understanding at a deeper level but i just say you know uh bureaucrats and legislate all of that that all comes down to ultimately us being understanding what's important and then putting together the kind of a persistent kind of uh, citizen involvement if you will and quite candidly things can be changed mm -hmm. so do you, do you guys find you know especially danny and Bakari with your you know local experience that you know, oftentimes people feel like the built environment's unchangeable. It's always been this way. Like, how could I change it? And is that a hurdle to getting people uh, and turning people into advocates? It, it may be a little bit more difficult for my environment than Danny's environment, but um, I, I wonder that about a lot of projects. Like I mentioned uh, the Clayton County Bus Rapid Transit Line earlier. I, I, that was one question I had when I attended Revolution last year was, how do we do this in a suburban landscape when every road links up to the arterial? So we don't have, it's, and, and I think that's the million dollar question. We can, it's just, are governments willing to? Are they willing to look at these? And it's especially like a lot of these developers that are buying up two or three blocks, are they considering putting in a grid so we can, have this accessibility and, and we can further our mobility in a lot of these places for for these people building these developments in the suburbs are you talking with the agencies on, on making this connection um gwinnett county has a, a whole factory of over 100 acres that they bought and, and intending for a train station as an extension of marta but four failed referendums later they're still there what what's the the end game are, are we going to continue to try to to get ourselves out of these congestions and, and especially with this environment to where like i said before that there's no connections it seems like and even with riding around and and just looking at these environments you is it's easy to just pick out how many streets actually connect to another arterial instead mm -hmm. of just dead ending in a, in a cul-de-sac it can be changed but it's just more of the willingness of Groups like mine, uh, and especially Motor, Motor City Freedom Riders, Pittsburghers for Public Transit, um, Transit Alliance in Miami, like a lot of these groups to, to, to point these out and bring these to the attention of governments of saying that this is what we're having to deal with, with this lack of connectivity. And we want to mm. be able to make this work and work with you, but you have to see what we see and we have to make mm we have to put this in a comprehensive plan not only we're going to add transit but we're going to add accessibility so more people can have access to it and we can reach it with an ease and not having to hop mm -hmm. through fence or find these these uh, rabbit paths around 
and any shortcuts. It, it should mm -hmm. be easy, it shouldn't be difficult. Mm -hmm. You know, it's so funny, Bakari, that you were saying, I'm, we might have an easier time with it. I was gonna say, you definitely have an easier time with it. I and mean, we have a we have a subway system that was almost entirely built before World War II. We have bus lines that trace the old trolley tracks from the 19th century. So people in New York definitely look at it and say, you know, it's a given, that's it. But I, I you know, I take tremendous inspiration from advocates for people with disabilities, you know, who, who have looked at a subway system that a generation after the American Disabilities Act is still overwhelmingly inaccessible. And it's a, it's a travesty, but it hasn't stopped an incredibly powerful coalition from building, from, you know, defying the odds that travel all over the city to demonstrate and, and demand change. And we are seeing elevators being built in places where no one thought they could even fit. Um, right. So that is a tremendous testament to perseverance, to coalition building, you know, all the stuff you were talking about. Right. And you're exactly right. That, what was 88, 1991. I remember when we, and why? Because we wouldn't even put lifts on buses. People were having to fuss about the basics. And so once again, if I show democratic process, it's not a spectator sport. Even with some of these things we talked about, look at what NACTO did with some of the changes that they made in terms of standards and stuff like that, the streetscape. So, I mean, there is progress but you got to stick it. You, it doesn't happen. We're talking about changing status quo and processes and institutions and all of that, which we all put in place. It got there. And now to disassemble those things takes the same kind of focus, same kind of attention, consistency and all of that. But just like Danny said, I think on the whole side of the ADA, just think about it, it was 1991. And quite candidly, we were buttheads because we wouldn't do the simple things. And they, they said, well, all right it'll wind up being statutory regulatory and we're on it okay and it's been still not enough fast enough but the 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 uh the, the, the just show you what you can do when you um are focused makes a big difference oh, that is a like i think a perfect you know spot to end on uh the, it's it's all you know it all just takes vision and and we could achieve so much if we if you know just throw out this you know, handshake deal of the 80-20 split that's really keeping us in the past and, and undermining any future investment in transit we can make with that that 20%. Uh, and also making it, you know, as of course impossible to, you know, reduce our tourist patient emissions. Uh, so I would just love to, I'm going to share my screen um, for a sec, because uh, I would love to uh, share uh, two actions that you could take uh, if you want to uh, 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 help us uh, you know tear down this rule uh, in the upcoming surface transportation authorization because uh, uh, as you know as in the uh, beginning of the presentation the uh, current long-term uh, federal transportation law the fast act is expiring this September which is a huge opportunity to actually fund transit and highways equally uh, and luckily there's been a lot of movement on this uh, in the last Congress representative Chewy Garcia from Chicago uh, co-introduced a resolution with uh, Representative Hakeem Jeffries and Representative Ayanna Presley uh, stating that we need uh, transit and highways to be funded equally. He's just reintroduced that uh, resolution. So we would love if you could send a message to your legislator asking them to co-sponsor it. Uh, so the link to that is in the chat. It's the, the T4 America link. Uh, it takes one minute. We have a pre-written message for you. All you have to do is put down your name uh, and then press take action. Uh, and the last thing is we have a couple of uh, social media uh, uh, toolkits. We have, a, we have a, a list of tweets or, or Facebook posts you could make uh, just stating your support for taking down the, for removing the 80-20 split and, and funding transit equally. Uh, that's the Google Docs link uh, at the end of this. But I'm also going to include these two links in the email that you'll receive since you attended this uh, with links to our other two webinars from the uh, Beyond EVs week. Uh, our Driving Down Emissions webinar, which goes into how our funding for highways is undermining our uh, climate goals by inducing more driving uh, and our uh, undoing the damage of urban freeways webinar that we co-hosted with uh, Third Way uh, and had uh, former uh, Transportation Secretary Anthony Fox speaking as well as Representative Nakeem Williams. Uh, so great, I just want to say, you know, thank you so much to our, our speakers. Uh, yeah, you, you all were so fantastic. I I, I really enjoyed this and I, I hope that uh, everyone watching uh, learned something new too. Uh, so thank you all. Thank you all so much. Um, 
it, it was this was a great conversation thank you thank you very much thank you so much for all the work that you all do which is really well, fabulous so thank you oh, well hopefully this is the year we can you know make a difference in uh reauthorization but we won't do it without you know all of you all taking action and we could never do it without you know local advocates you know like Bakari and danny who are you know, getting so many people on board to this vision for transit so oh, thank you all so much that was great Hey. Thank you. Well, I'm gonna. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 B